Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're breaking down the core parts for building your PC from zero to hero. Typically you'll need around eight main components to get a complete system up and running. So we have CPU, motherboard, CPU cooler, GPU, RAM, storage, power supply, and the case. But before we pick up anything, the first step is to figure out what you actually want to do with your PC. Are you gonna game? Working in an office setup, creating videos or art? or maybe diving into AI and machine learning. Knowing your usage helps you choose the right parts without overspending or ending up with something that doesn't quite fit your needs. I'll help you understand what each component does, what to watch out for, and what to pick precisely for your setup. So let's start with the CPU. This is the brain of your PC, let's call it like this. It processes all your commands and runs your programs. AMD Ryzen lineup goes from Ryzen 3, like an entry level, Ryzen 5 mid-range, Ryzen 7 high performance, and then we go with Ryzen 9, which is definitely an enthusiast grade uh, CPU. Intel has similar tiers, so we go with uh, past generation like Core i3, i5, i7 and i9 and their core ultra models like the well the strongest one currently i9 285k pushing performance even further now for example the amd ryzen 7 9800x3d and intel core ultra 9 285k are both powerful cpus great for gaming and heavy workloads if you really want to push the limits with the ryzen you can always go with the maximum with 99950 x3d but also if you're going in the mid tier you can go with ryzen 5 9600x so what do you consider compatibility with your motherboard uh, socket and chipset now we have number of cores and threads more means better multitasking definitely but also depends on what will you be doing will you be gaming or will you be doing some workloads that actually need loads of cores and similar stuff clock speeds for faster performance and think about use case gaming generally benefits from higher clock speeds and fewer cores while content creation and ai can use more cores so common mistakes, we have an AMD CPU and we have an Intel CPU. So don't swap the motherboards and the CPUs because they're not compatible. Quite logical, right? AMD goes on the AMD motherboard and Intel goes on an Intel motherboard. We have different chipsets, but we'll touch base for that on the motherboard uh, segment of this video. Now think of the motherboard as a backbone of your PC. It connects every component together and lets them communicate, for instance. It's a, a flat circuit board with slots and ports for your CPU, RAMs, uh, storage drives, GPU, and other peripherals. Models like MSI MIG X870E Tomahawk Wi-Fi and MSI MIG Z890 Tomahawk Wi-Fi offer features like fast USB ports, multiple M.2 slots uh, for SSDs, and solid power delivery systems. So for instance, you want to go with a mid-tier combination of motherboard and you don't want to overspend for your gaming PC or for your workstation because your needs are still not up there. So in those terms, you don't have to go with Z890 or X870E motherboards because we have different chipsets. And for instance, for Intel motherboards, you can go with B860 or when we talk about AMD, you can definitely go with B850, which can still deliver enough performance for your CPUs and everything combined with multiple M.2 slots, which I already mentioned, including quite nice speeds on the RAMs and giving you everything that you need for that mid-tier gaming or workstation PC. Now what to consider? We have socket type, must match your CPU exactly to work together. For example, we have AMD AM5 socket that fits Ryzen 7000 or 9000 series CPUs, while Intel's needs uh, LGA 1700 or 1851, depending on the generation of Intel processors. Now let's discuss the form factor. We have E80X, ATX, Micro ATX, and Mini ATX. So we have E80X, which is an extended ATX size of the motherboard, which usually fits in uh, larger cases or big towers. Then we go with the standard size, which is an ATX. This motherboard type, as well as the e ATX offers loads of slots and ports. When we discuss micro ATX and mini ATX motherboards and can fit in a compact cases, but have fewer slots and expansion options. Now for the power delivery or VRMs, for daily gaming use, look for motherboards with at least eight plus two phase VRM design. So basically you'll most likely find all boards having much more than that. But this ensures stable power delivery. Now with the close-up, you can definitely see what I'm talking about. And specifically, if you're going with the high-end enthusiast builds, 
do take a closer look at the VRM passive heat sinks because the larger they are, the better they will handle the huge load on them and definitely keep them cool while doing a heavy workload which will definitely benefit for improved cooling for the VRMs, but also in the case scenario where you want to overclock, that will be definitely beneficial. Now also, how many RAM slots are available, what speeds the motherboard can handle, and connectivity options like USB Type-C, USB Type-A, Ethernet ports, Wi-Fi support, internal ports, and everything all together. BIOS features, typically you can find the latest BIOS easily from the motherboard product page, which will definitely benefit you from upgrading to future processors, but in general compatibility with other products that will definitely benefit in performance later on. Now choosing your motherboard with limited features, for instance, like uh, poor VRM design, uh, less uh, storage capabilities with the M.2 slots, or additionally anything when we take into consideration connection, will definitely limit some future upgrades, which will end up costing you more than regular just because you'll need to swap your motherboard. So do be careful with that. Now, of course, your CPU generates heat when running and under load. So a cooler is essential to keep it from overheating and throttling and losing performance. There are two main types, air coolers and liquid coolers. So for instance, let's start with liquid coolers. We have right here the MSI MIG Core Liquid A15360, which uses radiator, three fans, we have tubes, we have the pump and the pump block cover, as well as the cold plate, which basically connects your CPU with the cold plate directly to the IHS of the processor and dissipates the heat from there. Now fans push the cold air through the radiator, which cools down the liquid that circulates in that closed loop and goes back to the cold plate on the CPU block. This helps to dissipate the heat from the processor, keeping it stable under heavy loads and giving you better performance. Now what to consider? We have to consider the compatibility. This is the most important thing. So make sure the cooler fits your CPU socket and of course your case, because what happens? Radiator size and fan clearance matter a lot. So for instance, what I can say is that 360 doesn't fit all cases, right? It could be strange for some of you guys, but regular cases can fit 360, either on front or on top. But if we go with something smaller, and I did mention micro ATX motherboards and ITX motherboards, they fit in a smaller cases. Now, 360 doesn't fit in some, there are some that can fit 360 on top, but then we go with much smaller chassis that don't have the compatibility or space to fit a 360. This is where we come in play with 240 or 280, which will give you an option to cool the processor. One thing that matters also here is the TDP. And then performance need. If you're gaming or doing regular tasks, a decent air cooler can be just enough. But for overclocking or heavy workloads or extreme gaming, a liquid cooler often performs better. For some of you guys, this might be the most interesting part because it's time to talk about the GPU. It handles all your graphics and visuals. It's key for gaming, video editing and 3D rendering. There are two main brands, we have NVIDIA and AMD, and latest we have Intel in the GPU segment. But the high-end cards, like for instance this one right here that I have, MSI GeForce RTX 5080 Supreme SoC, delivers incredible performance for modern games and creative workflows, including ray tracing and AI enhanced features. But for everyday gaming, you can consider lower models as well, like RTX 5060 and 5070, uh, depending on your resolution and target FPS. Of course, 12 gigabytes of VRAM is definitely a suggestion for newer games and don't mistake that for anything else. What to consider? We have high-end GPUs that can consume quite loads of wattage, so make sure your power supply can handle the wattage with some overhead. Now the power connector requirement is also quite important because RTX 40 and 50 series GPUs typically use the newer 12V uh, 2x6 16 pin connector, so make sure the power supply includes it. Now the physical size is also important when we're talking about the GPU because as you can see right here we have a thick graphic card which covers three and a half slots. So not all cases can support such big graphic cards because we have quite long, wide and thick GPU. So for instance, if you're going with a smaller chassis, this one definitely won't fit. VRAMs, what I mentioned is the graphic memory. 8 gigabytes is good for 1080p gaming, but definitely check out 12 gigabytes or more, which is ideal for 1440p and 4K gaming or professional creative workloads. And what I mentioned when we were talking about the motherboards, make sure your motherboard has the right PCI slot and your case has enough room and the airflow for the GPU. 
the common mistake that might happen buying a GPU too powerful for your power supply or too big for your case can cause headache during the build without a doubt, so be careful. RAM or memory modules, your PC short term memory uh, which stores data your system uses quickly, offers uh, tons of speeds and capacity for demanding tasks depending of course on what you're going to use it for and of course depending on the CPU brand. For better performance, I would definitely suggest going with dual channel configuration, which is quite logical. For example, 32 gigabyte setup would mean two times 16 gigs sticks. And we're talking about DDR5 in these terms since we are at that segment when you check out these two motherboards. Then if you're going with an extremely high capacity or high speed builds, uh, you can also consider a 4 DIM kit but you do have to be careful to check out the qualified vendor list of the motherboard if it supports it. 32 gigs for DDR5 is a good starting point and basically all kits are 2 times 16 nowadays, but for heavy multitasking, I would definitely suggest going with 2 times 32 gigs, speed and latency matter, but don't overpay for the highest speeds if you're on the budget. Also make sure your RAM is compatible with your motherboards, check support speeds and form factor because we have DDR4 still and DDR5, so depending on the motherboard, you do have to check out which one suits your board. Now what to take into consideration when building your PC and installing your RAMs? As you can see, the bottom part is the part where you connect it to your motherboard for the RAM slots. Be very careful and check out this cutout in the middle. Of course, DDR5 with the DDR5 motherboard support and then just simply check out where the cutout is on the motherboard. Now we have the M.2 SSD, we have Gen 3, Gen 4, Gen 5 and with all of those scenarios, this is where you store your operational system, games, um, you store your documents here or anything similar to that. Of course, there are multiple other solutions for storage, but we're talking about the PC, so let's go deeper into this. This is MSI Spatium M480 Pro with 2 terabytes of storage. And I would say the key features of specifically this one is high speeds when we're talking about Gen 4 combination. No cables, you're connecting it directly to the motherboard in the M.2 slot. I think 1 terabyte is basic for modern builds, but do take into consideration 2 terabytes or more if you're in the need of installing multiple games or storing large files. For the generation, as I mentioned, we have Gen 5 NVMe drives that are the fastest but more pricier. Then we have Gen 4, which I have it right here, is excellent for most users, which gives you performance, stability, and no thermal throttling. And then we go with Gen 3, which is a still good option for budget builds. Do take into consideration some other factors like SLC caching, DRAMs, and similar stuff like that. Now this smaller box right here is definitely one of the heaviest things in your PC. This is the power supply, right? And you have specifically this one, a fully modular. What this means? This means that you connect only the cables that you precisely need for connecting to your components and giving you power and life to your PC. So what we have right here is MSI MIG 8000 GL PCI 5. What does this mean? It has 12V 2x6 cable, which connects to the RTX 50 and 40 series, which gives the power directly and you don't need that extension cable that I mentioned with the GPU. There's also one more factor to consider. We have efficiency rating. So we have 80 plus and cybernetics. For 80 plus, we have bronze, gold, platinum, and titanium, where for gold or better means less wasted power and heat. But definitely do check what will suit your needs best. If you're going with a mid tier, you can definitely go with a high quality bronze or simply just go with a gold power supply that you won't have anything to worry about. Now the centerpiece of your build visual identity, I would call it like that. If you want to show off more of your components, then you're going to go with something that is more panoramic and offers a wide view and the impressive outlook. I'm going to mention the MSI MIG panel 110RPZ that definitely looks quite impressive and comes with a couple of pre-installed friends. This holds your components together and when we're talking about this specific case it offers good airflow and enough space for your build. Now the form factor to fit your motherboard is also quite important. This specific case supports ATX, Micro ATX and Mini ITX motherboards. We have full tower cases, which are huge and support maximum cooling and expansions. Then we have mid tower cases like this one, which are great all-arounder and they don't take too much space on your desk. 
while the mini tower and compact cases like small form factors save space but limit the parts compatibility. The one thing that is quite important and uh, what not to cheap out on. Some parts you really want to invest in quality wise. So let's start with the power supply. A bad power supply can damage your competence and cause instability. Spend on a reliable brand with good efficiency and enough wattage. Motherboards, it's your build's backbone. So cheaper boards might miss important features or have weaker VRMs that limit the CPU performance. And CPU coolers, a good cooler can definitely push the processor to its limits for the performance, which will of course benefit only you. And that would be a quick overview of all the PC parts that you need to start building your PC. Now remember, your PC parts should always be a reflection of what you're going to do with your PC. Is it going to be gaming? Is it going to be excessive workloads, AI or anything similar to that? Do take everything into consideration. Of course, finally, don't forget to check out the link in the description for MSI free PC build guide, which is super helpful if you need and if you want to have a step-by-step -step walkthrough. If this was a helpful video for you or you have some additional questions, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe and click the notification bell. And of course, leave a comment, start the conversation. If you need any advice in general when we're talking about specific PC parts, I'm glad to help and always will answer your comment. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye bye guys.